Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 2 Where I Lived and What I Lived For At a certain season of our lives, we are accustomed to consider every spot as the possible site of a house. I have thus surveyed the country on every side within a dozen miles of where I live. In imagination I have bought all the farms in succession, for all were to be bought, and I knew their price. I walked over each farmer's premises, tasted his wild apples, discoursed on husbandry with him, took his farm at his price, at any price, mortgaging it to him in my mind, even put a higher price on it, took everything but a deed of it, took his word for his deed, for I dearly love to talk, cultivated it, and him too to some extent, I trust, and withdrew when I had enjoyed it long enough, leaving him to carry it on. This experience entitled me to be regarded as a sort of real estate broker by my friends. Wherever I sat, there I might live, and the landscape radiated from me accordingly. What is a house but a seds, a seat? Better if a country seat. I discovered many a site for a house not likely to be soon improved, which some might have thought too far from the village, but to my eyes the village was too far from it. Well, there I might live, I said, and there I did live, for an hour, a summer, and a winter life saw how I could let the years run off, buffet the winter through, and see the spring come in. The future inhabitants of this region, wherever they may place their houses, may be sure that they have been anticipated. An afternoon sufficed to lay out the land into orchard, woodlot, and pasture, and to decide what fine oaks or pines should be left to stand before the door, and whence each blasted tree could be seen to the best advantage. And then I let it lie, fallow, perchance, for a man is rich in proportion to the number of things which he can afford to let alone. My imagination carried me so far that I even had the refusal of several farms. The refusal was all I wanted. But I never got my fingers burned by actual possession. The nearest that I came to actual possession was when I bought the hollow well place, and had begun to sort my seeds, and collected materials with which to make a wheelbarrow to carry it on or off with. But before the owner gave me a deed of it, his wife—every man has such a wife—changed her mind, and wished to keep it and he offered me ten dollars to release him. Now, to speak the truth, I had but ten cents in the world, and it surpassed my arithmetic to tell if I was that man who had ten cents, or who had a farm, or ten dollars, or altogether. However, I let him keep the ten dollars, and the farm too, for I had carried it far enough. Or rather, to be generous, I sold him the farm, for just what I gave for it, and, as he was not a rich man, made him a present of ten dollars, and still had my ten cents, and seeds, and materials for a wheelbarrow left. I found thus that I had been a rich man, without any damage to my poverty, but I retained the landscape, and I have since annually carried off what it yielded without a wheelbarrow. With respect to landscapes, quote, I am monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. End quote. I have frequently seen a poet withdraw, having enjoyed the most valuable part of a farm, while the crusty farmer supposed that he had got a few wild apples only. Why, the owner does not know it for many years, when a poet has put his farm 
in rhyme, the most admirable kind of invisible fence, has fairly impounded it, milked it, skimmed it, and got all the cream, and left the farmer only the skimmed milk. The real attractions of the Hollowell farm, to me, were its complete retirement, being about two miles from the village, half a mile from the nearest neighbor, and separated from the highway by a broad field. Its bounding on the river, which the owner said protected it, by its fogs from frosts in the spring, though that was nothing to me. The gray color and ruinous state of the house and barn, and the dilapidated fences, which put such an interval between me and the last occupant. The hollow and lichen-covered apple trees, gnawed by rabbits, showing what kind of neighbors I should have. But above all, the recollection I had of it from my earliest voyages up the river, when the house was concealed behind a dense grove of red maples, through which I heard the house-dog bark. I was in haste to buy it, before the proprietor finished getting out some rocks, cutting down the hollow apple trees, and grubbing up some young birches which had sprung up in the pasture, or, in short, had made any more of his improvements. To enjoy these advantages I was ready to carry it on, like Atlas to take the world on my shoulders. I never heard what compensation he received for that and do all those things which had no other motive or excuse but that I might pay for it and be unmolested in my possession of it, for I knew all the while that it would yield the most abundant crop of the kind I wanted, if I could only afford to let it alone. But it turned out as I have said. All that I could say, then, with respect to farming on a large scale, I have always cultivated a garden was that I had my seeds ready. Many think that seeds improve with age. I have no doubt that time discriminates between the good and the bad, and when at last I shall plant I shall be less likely to be disappointed. But I would say to my fellows, once for all, as long as possible, live free and uncommitted. It makes but little difference whether you are committed to a farm or the county jail. Old Cato, whose Dere Rustica is my cultivator, says, and the only translation I have seen makes sheer nonsense of the passage, quote, When you think of getting a farm, turn it thus in your mind, not to buy greedily, nor spare your pains to look at it, and do not think it enough to go round it once. The oftener you go there, the more it will please you, if it is good. I think I shall not buy greedily, but go round and round it as long as I live, and be buried in it first, that it may please me the more at last. The present was my next experiment of this kind, which I purpose to describe more at length, for convenience putting the experience of two years into one. As I have said, I do not propose to write an ode to dejection, but to brag as lustily as Chanticleer in the morning, standing on his roost, if only to wake my neighbors up. When first I took up my abode in the woods, that is, began to spend my nights as well as my days there, which by accident was on Independence Day, or the 4th of July, 1845. My house was not finished for winter, but was merely a defense against the rain, without plastering or chimney, the walls being of rough, weather-stained boards with wide chinks, which made it cool at night. The upright white-hewn studs and freshly planed door and window casings gave it a clean and airy look, especially in the morning when its timbers were saturated with dew, so that I fancied that by noon some sweet gum would exude from them. 
to my imagination it retained throughout the day more or less of this auroral character, reminding me of a certain house on a mountain which I had visited a year before. This was an airy and unplastered cabin fit to entertain a traveling god, and where a goddess might trail her garments. The winds which passed over my dwelling were such as sweep over the ridges of mountains, bearing the broken strains, or celestial parts only, of terrestrial music. The morning wind forever blows. The poem of creation is uninterrupted, but few are the ears that hear it. Olympus is but the outside of the earth everywhere. The only house I had been the owner of before, if I accept a boat, was a tent, which I used occasionally when making excursions in the summer, and this is still rolled up in my garret. But the boat, after passing from hand to hand, has gone down the stream of time. With this more substantial shelter about me, I had made some progress toward settling in the world. This frame, so slightly clad, was a sort of crystallization around me, and reacted on the builder. It was suggestive somewhat, as a picture in outlines. I did not need to go outdoors to take the air, for the atmosphere within had lost none of its freshness. It was not so much within doors as behind a door where I sat, even in the rainiest weather. The Haravansa says, quote, An abode without birds is like a meat without seasoning. End quote. Such was not my abode, for I found myself suddenly neighbor to the birds, not by having imprisoned one, but having caged myself near them. I was not only nearer to some of those which commonly frequent the garden and the orchard, but to those smaller and more thrilling songsters of the forest which never, or rarely, serenade a villager, the wood thrush, the veery, the scarlet tanager, the field sparrow, the whippoorwill, and many others. I was seated by the shore of a small pond about a mile and a half south of the village of Concord, and somewhat higher than it, in the midst of an extensive wood between that town and Lincoln, and about two miles south of that our only field known to fame, Concord Battleground. But I was so low in the woods that the opposite shore, half a mile off, like the rest, covered with wood, was my most distant horizon. For the first week, whenever I looked out on the pond, it impressed me like a tarn high up on the side of a mountain, its bottom far above the surface of other lakes, and as the sun arose I saw it throwing off its nightly clothing of mist, and here and there by degrees its soft ripples or its smooth reflecting surface was revealed, while the mists like ghosts, were stealthily withdrawing in every direction into the woods, as at the breaking up of some nocturnal conventicle. The very dew seemed to hang upon the trees later into the day than usual, as on the sides of mountains. This small lake was of most value as a neighbor in the intervals of a gentle rainstorm in August when, both air and water being perfectly still but the sky overcast, mid-afternoon had all the serenity of evening, and the wood-thrush sang around and was heard from shore to shore. A lake like this is never smoother than at such a time, and the clear portion of the air above it being shallow and darkened by clouds, the water 
full of light and reflections, becomes a lower heaven itself so much the more important. From a hilltop nearby, where the wood had been recently cut off, there was a pleasing vista southward across the pond, through a wide indentation in the hills which form the shore there, where their opposite sides, sloping toward each other, suggested a stream flowing out in that direction, through a wooded valley, but stream there was none. That way I looked between and over the near green hills to some distant and higher ones in the horizon tinged with blue. Indeed, by standing on tiptoe I could catch a glimpse of some of the peaks of the still bluer and more distant mountain ranges in the northwest, those true blue coins from heaven's own mint, and also of some portion of the village. But in other directions, even from this point, I could not see over or beyond the woods which surrounded me. It is well to have some water in your neighborhood, to give buoyancy to and float the earth. One value even of the smallest well is that when you look into it you see that earth is not continent, but insular. This is as important as that it keeps butter cool. When I looked across the pond from this peak toward the Sudbury Meadows, which in time of flood I distinguished elevated perhaps by a mirage in their seething valley, like a coin in a basin, all the earth beyond the pond appeared like a thin crust insulated and floated even by this small sheet of interverting water, and I was reminded that this on which I dwelt was but dry land. Though the view from my door was still more contracted, I did not feel crowded or confined in the least. There was pasture enough for my imagination. The low shrub oak plateau to which the opposite shore arose stretched away toward the prairies of the west and the steppes of Tartary, affording ample room for all the roving families of men. Quote, there are none happy in the world but beings who enjoy freely a vast horizon, end quote. said Damodara when his herds required new and larger pastures. Both place and time were changed, and I dwelt nearer to those parts of the universe and to those eras in history which had most attracted me. Where I lived was as far off as many a region viewed nightly by astronomers. We are wont to imagine rare and delectable places in some remote and more celestial corner of the system, behind the constellation of Cassiopeia's chair, far from noise and disturbance. I discovered that my house actually had its sight in such a withdrawn, but forever new and unprofaned, part of the universe. If it were worth the while to settle in those parts near to the Pleiades or the Hyades, or to Aldebaran or Altair, then I was really there, or at an equal remoteness from the life which I had left behind, dwindled and twinkling with as fine a ray to my nearest neighbor, and to be seen only in moonless nights by him. Such was that part of creation where I had squatted. Quote, there was a shepherd that did live, and held his thoughts as high, as were the mounts whereon his flocks did hourly feed him by. End quote. What should we think of the shepherd's life if his flocks always wandered to higher pastures than his thoughts? Every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity 
and I may say innocence, with nature herself. I have been as sincere a worshipper of Aurora as the Greeks. I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise, and one of the best things which I did. They say that characters were engraven on the bathing tub of King Ching Thang, to this effect, quote, Renew thyself completely each day. Do it again, and again, and forever again. End quote. I can understand that. Morning brings back the heroic ages. I was as much affected by the faint hum of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn, when I was sitting with door and windows open, as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. It was Homer's requiem itself an Iliad and Odyssey in the air, singing its own wrath and wanderings. There was something cosmical about it, a standing advertisement, till forbidden, of the everlasting vigor and fertility of the world. The morning, which is the most memorable season of the day, is the awakening hour. Then there is least somnolence in us, and, for an hour at least, some part of us awakes which slumbers all the rest of the day and night. Little is to be expected of that day, if it can be called a day, to which we are not awakened by our genius, but by the mechanical nudgings of some servitor, are not awakened by our own newly acquired force and aspirations from within, accompanied by the undulations of celestial music instead of factory bells, and a fragrance filling the air, to a higher life than we fell asleep from, and thus the darkness bear its fruit and prove itself to be good, no less than the light. That man who does not believe that each day contains an earlier, more sacred, and auroral hour than he has yet profaned, has despaired of life, and is pursuing a descending and darkening way. After a partial cessation of his sensuous life, the soul of man, or its organs rather, are reinvigorated each day, and his genius tries again what noble life it can make. All memorable events, I should say, transpire in morning time and in a morning atmosphere. The Vedas say, Quote, all intelligences awake with the morning. End quote. Poetry and art and the fairest and most memorable of the actions of men date from such an hour. All poets and heroes, like Memnon, are the children of Aurora and emit their music at sunrise. To him whose elastic and vigorous thought keeps pace with the sun, the day is a perpetual morning. It matters not what the clocks say or the attitudes and labors of men. Morning is when I am awake, and there is a dawn in me. Moral reform is the effort to throw off sleep. Why is it that men give so poor an account of their day if they have not been slumbering? They are not such poor calculators. If they had not been overcome with drowsiness, they would have performed something. The millions are awake enough for physical labor, but only one in a million 
is awake enough for effective intellectual exertion, only one in a hundred millions to a poetic or divine life. To be awake is to be alive. I have never yet met a man who was quite awake. How could I have looked him in the face? We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn, which does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue, and so to make a few objects beautiful. But it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look which morally we can do. To affect the quality of the day, that is the highest of arts. Every man is tasked to make his life, even in its details, worthy of the contemplation of his most elevated and critical hour. If we refused, or rather used up, such paltry information as we get, the oracles would distinctly inform us how this might be done. End of chapter 2 Part 1 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 2 Part 2 I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation, unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms, and, if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it, and publish its meanness to the world, or, if it were sublime, to know it by experience, and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. For most men, it appears to me, are in a strange uncertainty about it, whether it is of the devil or of God, and have somewhat hastily concluded that it is the chief end of man here to Quote, glorify God and enjoy Him forever. End quote. Still, we live meanly, like ants, though the fable tells us that we were long ago changed into men. Like pygmies, we fight with cranes. It is error upon error, and clout upon clout, and our best virtue has for its occasion a superfluous and evitable wretchedness. Our life is frittered away by detail. An honest man has hardly need to count more than his ten fingers, or, in extreme cases, he may add his ten toes and lump the rest. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I say, let your affairs be as two or three and not a hundred or a thousand. Instead of a million, count half a dozen, and keep your accounts on your thumbnail. In the midst of this chopping sea of civilized life, 
such are the clouds and storms and quicksands and thousand and one items to be allowed for that a man has to live if he would not founder and go to the bottom and not make his port at all by dead reckoning and he must be a great calculator indeed who succeeds simplify simplify instead of three meals a day if it be necessary eat but one instead of a hundred dishes five and reduce other things in proportion our life is like a german confederacy made up of petty states with its boundary forever fluctuating so that even a german cannot tell you how it is bounded at any moment the nation itself with all its so-called internal improvements which by the way are all external and superficial is just such an unwieldy and overgrown establishment cluttered with furniture and tripped up by its own traps ruined by luxury and heedless expense by want of calculation and a worthy aim as a million households in the land and the only cure for it as for them is in rigid economy a stern and more than spartan simplicity of life and elevation of purpose it lives too fast men think that it is essential that the nation have commerce and export ice and talk through a telegraph and ride thirty miles an hour without a doubt whether they do or not but whether we should live like baboons or like men is a little uncertain if we do not get out sleepers and forge rails and devote days and nights to the work but go to tinkering upon our lives to improve them who will build railroads and if railroads are not built how shall we get to heaven in season but if we stay at home and mind our business who will want railroads we do not ride on the railroad it rides upon us did you ever think what those sleepers are that underlie the railroad each one is a man an irishman or a yankee man the rails are laid on them and they are covered with sand and the cars run smoothly over them they are sound sleepers i assure you and every few years a new lot is laid down and run over so that if some have the pleasure of riding on a rail others have the misfortune to be ridden upon and when they run over a man that is walking in his sleep a supernumerary sleeper in the wrong position and wake him up they suddenly stop the cars and make a hue and cry about it as if this were an exception I am glad to know that it takes a gang of men for every five miles to keep the sleepers down and level in their beds, as it is, for this is a sign that they may, some time, get up again. Why should we live with such hurry and waste of life? We are determined to be starved before we are hungry. Men say that a stitch in time saves nine and so they take a thousand stitches to-day to save nine to-morrow as for work we haven't any of any consequence we have the saint vitus dance and cannot possibly keep our heads still if i should only give a few pulls at the parish bell rope as for a fire that is without setting the bell there is hardly a man on his farm in the outskirts of concord notwithstanding that press of engagements which was his excuse so many times this morning nor a boy nor a woman i might almost say 
but would forsake all and follow that sound, not mainly to save property from the flames, but, if we will confess the truth, much more to see it burn, since burn it must. And we, be it known, did not set it on fire, or to see it put out and have a hand in it, if that is done as handsomely. Yes, even if it were the parish church itself. Hardly a man takes a half-hour's nap after dinner, but when he wakes he holds up his head and asks, "'What's the news?' as if the rest of mankind had stood his sentinels. Some give directions to be waked every half-hour, doubtless for no other purpose, and then to pay for it they tell what they have dreamed. After a night's sleep the news is as indispensable as the breakfast. Pray tell me anything new that has happened to a man anywhere on this globe. And he reads it over his coffee and rolls, that a man has had his eyes gouged out this morning on the Wachito River, never dreaming the while that he lives in the dark, unfathomed mammoth cave of this world, and has but the rudiment of an eye himself. For my part, I could easily do without the post-office. I think that there are very few important communications made through it. To speak critically, I never received more than one or two letters in my life, I wrote this some years ago, that were worth the postage. The penny post is, commonly, an institution through which you seriously offer a man that penny for his thoughts which is so often safely offered in jest. And I am sure that I never read any memorable news in a newspaper. If we read of one man robbed, or murdered, or killed by accident, or one house burned, or one vessel wrecked, or one steamboat blown up, or one cow run over on the western railroad, or one mad dog killed, or one lot of grasshoppers in the winter. We never need read of another. One is enough. If you are acquainted with the principle, what do you care for a myriad instances and applications? To a philosopher all news, as it is called, is gossip, and they who edit and read it are old women over their tea. Yet not a few are greedy after this gossip. There was such a rush, as I hear, the other day, at one of the offices to learn the foreign news by the last arrival, that several large squares of plate-glass belonging to the establishment were broken by the pressure. News which I seriously think a ready wit might write a twelve-month or twelve years beforehand with sufficient accuracy. As for Spain, for instance, if you know how to throw in Don Carlos and the Infanta, and Don Pedro and Seville and Granada from time to time in the right proportions, they may have changed the names a little since I saw the papers, and serve up a bullfight when other entertainments fail, it will be true to the letter and give us as good an idea of the exact state or ruin of things in Spain as the most succinct and lucid reports under this head in the newspapers. And as for England, almost the last significant scrap of news from that quarter was the revolution of 1649. And if you have learned the history of her crops for an average year, you never need attend to that thing again unless your speculations are of a merely pecuniary character. If one may judge, who rarely looks into the newspapers, nothing new does ever happen in foreign parts, a French Revolution not excepted. What news? How much more important to know what that is which was never old. Quote, Keyu Hiyu, great dignitary of the state of Wei, sent a man to Gong Tsiu to know his news. 
Gong Tsiu caused the messenger to be seated near him, and questioned him in these terms. What is your master doing? The messenger answered with respect. My master desires to diminish the number of his faults, but he cannot come to the end of them. The messenger being gone, the philosopher remarked, What a worthy messenger! What a worthy messenger! End quote. The preacher, instead of vexing the ears of drowsy farmers on their day of rest at the end of the week, for Sunday is the fit conclusion of an ill-spent week, and not the fresh and brave beginning of a new one, with this one other draggle tale of a sermon, should shout with thundering voice, Pause! Avast! Why so seeming fast, but deadly slow? Shams and delusions are esteemed for soundest truths, while reality is fabulous. If men would steadily observe realities only, and not allow themselves to be deluded, life, to compare it with such things as we know, would be like a fairy tale and the Arabian Nights' entertainments. If we respected only what is inevitable, and has a right to be, music and poetry would resound along the streets. When we are unhurried and wise, we perceive that only great and worthy things have any permanent and absolute existence, that petty fears and petty pleasures are but the shadow of the reality. This is always exhilarating and sublime. By closing the eyes and slumbering, and consenting to be deceived by shows, men establish and confirm their daily life of routine and habit everywhere, which still is built on purely illusory foundations. Children who play life, discern its true law and relations more clearly than men who fail to live it worthily, but who think that they are wiser by experience, that is, by failure. I have read in a Hindu book that, quote, there was a king's son who, being expelled in infancy from his native city, was brought up by a forester, and, growing up to maturity in that state, imagined himself to belong to the barbarous race with which he lived. One of his father's ministers, having discovered him, revealed to him what he was, and the misconception of his character was removed, and he knew himself to be a prince." So soul, end quote, continues the Hindu philosopher, quote, from the circumstances in which it is placed, mistakes its own character until the truth is revealed to it by some holy teacher, and then it knows itself to be Brahman. End quote. I perceive that we inhabitants of New England live this mean life that we do because our vision does not penetrate the surface of things. We think that that is which appears to be. If a man should walk through this town and see only the reality, where, think you, would the mill-dam go to, if he should give us an account of the realities he beheld there, we should not recognize the place in his description. Look at a meeting-house, or a courthouse, or a jail, or a shop, or a dwelling-house, and say what that thing really is before a true gaze and they would all go to pieces in your account of them. Men esteem truth remote, 
in the outskirts of the system, behind the farthest star, before Adam, and after the last man. In eternity there is indeed something true and sublime. But all these times and places and occasions are now and here. God himself culminates in the present moment, and will never be more divine in the lapse of all the ages. And we are enabled to apprehend at all what is sublime and noble only by the perpetual instilling and wrenching of the reality that surrounds us. The universe constantly and obediently answers to our conceptions. Whether we travel fast or slow, the track is laid for us. Let us spend our lives in conceiving, then. The poet or the artist never yet had so fair and noble a design but some of his posterity at least could accomplish it. Let us spend one day as deliberately as nature, and not be thrown off the track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. Let us rise early and fast, or break fast gently and without perturbation. Let company come and let company go. Let the bells ring and the children cry, determined to make a day of it. Why should we knock under and go with the stream? Let us not be upset and overwhelmed in that terrible, rapid, and whirlpool called a dinner, situated in the meridian shallows. Weather this danger, and you are safe, for the rest of the way is downhill. With unrelaxed nerves, with morning vigor, sail by it, looking another way, tied to the mast like Ulysses. If the engine whistles, let it whistle till it is hoarse for its pains. If the bell rings, why should we run? We will consider what kind of music they are like. Let us settle ourselves and work and wedge our feet downward through the mud and slush of opinion and prejudice and tradition and delusion and appearance, that alluvian which covers the globe through Paris and London, through New York and Boston and Concord, through church and state, through poetry and philosophy and religion, till we come to a hard bottom and rocks in place, which we can call reality, and say, this is, and no mistake, and then begin having a point de puy, below freshet and frost and fire, a place where you might found a wall or a state or set a lamp-post safely, or perhaps a gauge, not a nilometer, but a realometer, that future ages might know how deep a freshet of shams and appearances had gathered from time to time. If you stand right fronting and face to face to a fact, you will see the sun glimmer on both its surfaces, as if it were a scimitar, and feel its sweet 
edge dividing you through the heart and marrow, and so you will happily conclude your mortal career. Be it life or death, we crave only reality. If we are really dying, let us hear the rattle in our throats and feel cold in the extremities. If we are alive, let us go about our business. Time is but the stream I go a-fishing in. I drink at it, but while I drink I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. Its thin current slides away, but eternity remains. I would drink deeper, fish in the sky, whose bottom is pebbly with stars. I cannot count one. I know not the first letter of the alphabet. I have always been regretting but I was not as wise as the day I was born. The intellect is a cleaver. It discerns and rifts its way into the secret of things. I do not wish to be any more busy with my hands than is necessary. My head is hands and feet. I feel all my best faculties concentrated in it. My instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing, as some creatures use their snout and forepaws, and with it I would mine and burrow my way through these hills. I think that the richest vein is somewhere hereabouts. So, by the divining rod and thin rising vapors I judge, and here I will begin to mine. End of chapter 2 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 3 Reading with a little more deliberation in the choice of their pursuits, all men would perhaps become essentially students and observers. For certainly their nature and destiny are interesting to all alike. In accumulating property for ourselves or our posterity, in founding a family or a state, or acquiring fame even, we are mortal. But in dealing with truth we are immortal, and need fear no change nor accident. The oldest Egyptian or Hindu philosopher raised a corner of the veil from the statue of the divinity, and still the trembling robe remains raised, and I gaze upon as fresh a glory as he did, since it was I in him that was then so bold, and it is he in me that now reviews the vision. No dust has settled on that robe, no time has elapsed since that divinity was revealed. That time which we really improve, or which is improvable, is neither past, present, nor future. My residence was more favorable not only to thought, but to serious reading, than a university, and though I was beyond the range of the ordinary circulating library, I had more than ever come within the influence of those books which circulate round the world, whose sentences were first written on bark, and are now merely copied from time to time onto linen paper. Says the poet Mr. Udd, Being seated, 
to run through the region of the spiritual world, I have had this advantage in books. To be intoxicated by a single glass of wine, I have experienced this pleasure when I have drunk the liquor of the esoteric doctrines. I kept Homer's Iliad on my table through the summer, though I looked at his page only now and then. Incessant labor with my hands, at first, for I had my house to finish and my beans to hoe at the same time, made more study impossible. Yet I sustained myself by the prospect of such reading in future. I read one or two shallow books of travel in the intervals of my work, till that employment made me ashamed of myself, and I asked where it was then that I lived. The student may read Homer or Aeschylus in the Greek without danger of dissipation or luxuriousness, for it implies that he in some measure emulate their heroes and consecrate morning hours to their pages. The heroic books, even if printed in the character of our mother tongue, will always be in a language dead to degenerate times, and we must laboriously seek the meaning of each word and line, conjecturing a larger sense than common use permits out of what wisdom and valor and generosity we have. The modern, cheap, and fertile press, with all its translations, has done little to bring us nearer to the heroic writers of antiquity. They seem as solitary, and the letter in which they are printed as rare and curious as ever. It is worth the expense of youthful days and costly hours, if you learn only some words of an ancient language, which are raised out of the trivialness of the street, to be perpetual suggestions and provocations. It is not in vain that the farmer remembers and repeats the few Latin words which he has heard. Men sometimes speak as if the study of the classics would at length make way for more modern and practical studies. But the adventurous student will always study classics, in whatever language they may be written and however ancient they may be. For what are the classics but the noblest recorded thoughts of man? They are the only oracles which are not decayed, and there are such answers to the most modern inquiry in them as Delphi and Dodona never gave. We might as well omit to study nature because she is old. To read well, that is, to read true books in a true spirit, is a noble exercise, and one that will task the reader more than any exercise which the customs of the day esteem. It requires a training such as the athletes underwent, the steady intention almost of the whole life to this object. Books must be read as deliberately and reservedly as they were written. It is not enough to be able to speak the language of that nation by which they are written, for there is a memorable interval between the spoken and the written language, the language heard and the language read. The one is commonly transitory, a sound, a tongue, a dialect, merely, almost brutish, and we learn it unconsciously, like the brutes of our mothers. The other is the maturity and experience of that, if that is our mother tongue. This is our father tongue, a reserved and select expression, too significant to be heard by the ear, 
which we must be born again in order to speak. The crowds of men who merely spoke the Greek and Latin tongues in the Middle Ages were not entitled by the accident of birth to read the works of genius written in those languages, for these were not written in that Greek or Latin which they knew, but in the select language of literature. They had not learned the nobler dialects of Greece and Rome, but the very materials on which they were written were waste paper to them, and they prized instead a cheap contemporary literature. But when the several nations of Europe had acquired distinct, though rude, written languages of their own, sufficient for the purposes of their rising literatures, then first learning revived, and scholars were enabled to discern from that remoteness the treasures of antiquity. What the Roman and Grecian multitude could not hear, after the lapse of ages, a few scholars read, and a few scholars only are still reading it. However much we may admire the orator's occasional bursts of eloquence, the noblest written words are commonly as far behind or above the fleeting spoken language as the firmament with its stars is behind the clouds. There are the stars, and they who can may read them. The astronomers forever comment on and observe them. They are not exhalations like our daily colloquies and vaporous breath. What is called eloquence in the forum is commonly found to be rhetoric in the study. The orator yields to the inspiration of a transient occasion, and speaks to the mob before him, to those who can hear him. But the writer, whose more equable life is his occasion, and who would be distracted by the event in the crowd of which inspire the orator, speaks to the intellect and health of mankind, to all in any age who can understand him. No wonder that Alexander carried the Iliad with him on his expeditions in a precious casket. A written word is the choicest of relics. It is something at once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art. It is the work of art nearest to life itself. It may be translated into every language, and not only be read but actually breathed from all human lips, not be represented on canvas or in marble only, but be carved out of the breath of life itself. The symbol of an ancient man's thought becomes a modern man's speech. Two thousand summers have imparted to the monuments of Grecian literature as to her marbles, only a maturer golden and autumnal tint, for they have carried their own serene and celestial atmosphere into all lands to protect them against the corrosion of time. Books are the treasured wealth of the world, and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Books, the oldest and the best, stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage. They have no cause of their own to plead. But while they enlighten and sustain the reader, his common sense will not refuse them. Their authors are a natural 
and irresistible aristocracy in every society, and more than kings or emperors, exert an influence on mankind. When the illiterate and perhaps scornful trader has earned by enterprise and industry his coveted leisure and independence and is admitted to the circles of wealth and fashion, he turns inevitably at last to those still higher but yet inaccessible circles of intellect and genius, and is sensible only of the imperfection of his culture and the vanity and insufficiency of all his riches, and further proves his good sense by the pains which be taken to secure for his children that intellectual culture whose want he so keenly feels. And thus it is that he becomes the founder of a family. Those who have not learned to read the ancient classics in the language in which they were written must have a very imperfect knowledge of the history of the human race, for it is remarkable that no transcript of them has ever been made into any modern tongue, unless our civilization itself may be regarded as such a transcript. Homer has never yet been printed in English nor Aeschylus, nor Virgil even, works as refined, as solidly done, and as beautiful almost as the morning itself. For later writers, say what we will of their genius, have rarely, if ever, equaled the elaborate beauty and finish and the life-long and heroic literary labors of the ancients. They only talk of forgetting them who never knew them. It will be soon enough to forget them when we have the learning and the genius which will enable us to attend to and appreciate them. That age will be rich indeed when those relics which we call classics, and the still older and more than classic but even less known scriptures of the nations, shall have still further accumulated, when the Vaticans shall be filled with Vedas and Zendavestas and Bibles with Homers and Dantes and Shakespeare's, and all the centuries to come shall have successively deposited their trophies in the forum of the world. By such a pile, we may hope to scale heaven at last. The works of the great poets have never yet been read by mankind, for only great poets can read them. They have only been read as the multitude read the stars, at most astrologically, not astronomically. Most men have learned to read to serve a paltry convenience, as they have learned to cipher in order to keep accounts and not be cheated in trade, but of reading as a noble intellectual exercise they know little or nothing. Yet this only is reading, in a high sense, not that which lulls us as a luxury and suffers the nobler faculties to sleep the while, but what we have to stand on tiptoe to read and devote our most alert and wakeful hours to. I think that having learned our letters we should read the best that is in literature, and not be forever repeating our A, B, A, Bs, and words of one syllable in the fourth or fifth classes sitting on the lowest and foremost form all our lives. 
Most men are satisfied if they read or hear read, and perchance have been convicted by the wisdom of one good book, the Bible, and for the rest of their lives vegetate and dissipate their faculties in what is called easy reading. There is a work in several volumes in our circulating library entitled Little Reading, which I thought referred to a town of that name which I had not been to. There are those who, like cormorants and ostriches, can digest all sorts of this, even after the fullest dinner of meats and vegetables, for they suffer nothing to be wasted. If others are the machines to provide this provender, they are the machines to read it. They read the nine thousandth tale about Zebulon and Zophronia, and how they loved as none had ever loved before, and neither did the course of their true love run smooth, at any rate how it did run and stumble and get up again and go on, how some poor unfortunate got up on to a steeple who had better never have gone up as far as the belfry, and then having needlessly got him up there, the happy novelist rings the bell for all the world to come together and hear, oh dear, how he did get down again. For my part, I think that they had better metamorphose all such aspiring heroes of universal noveldom into man-weathercocks, as they used to put heroes among the constellations, and let them swing round there till they are rusty, and not come down at all to bother honest men with their pranks. The next time the novelist rings the bell, I will not stir, though the meeting-house burn down. The skip of the tiptoe hop a romance of the Middle Ages by the celebrated author of Tittle Tall Tan to appear in monthly parts. A great rush, don't all come together. All this they read with saucer eyes, and erect and primitive curiosity, and with unwearied gizzard, whose corrugations even yet need no sharpening, just as some little four-year-old bencher his two-cent gilt-covered edition of Cinderella, without any improvement that I can see in the pronunciation or accent or emphasis or any more skill in extracting or inserting the moral. The result is dullness of sight, a stagnation of the vital circulations, and a general deliquium and sloughing off of all the intellectual faculties. This sort of gingerbread is baked daily, and more sedulously than pure wheat or rye and Indian in almost every oven, and finds a surer market. The best books are not read even by those who are called good readers. What does our Concord culture amount to? There is in this town, with a very few exceptions, no taste for the best or for very good books, even in English literature, whose words all can read and spell. Even the college-bred and so-called liberally educated men here and everywhere have really little or no acquaintance with the English classics, and as for the recorded wisdom of mankind, the ancient classics and Bibles, which are accessible to all who will know of them, there are the feeblest efforts anywhere made to become acquainted with them. I know a woodchopper of middle age, who takes a French paper, not for news, as he says, for he is above that, but to keep himself in practice, he being a Canadian by birth, and when I ask him what he considers the best thing he can do in this world, he says, besides this, 
to keep up and add to his English. This is about as much as the college-bred generally do or aspire to do, and they take an English paper for the purpose. One who has just come from reading, perhaps one of the best English books, will find how many with whom he can converse about it. Or suppose he comes from reading a Greek or Latin classic in the original, whose praises are familiar even to the so-called illiterate, he will find nobody at all to speak to, but must keep silence about it. Indeed, there is hardly the professor in our colleges who, if he has mastered the difficulties of the language, has proportionally mastered the difficulties of the wit and poetry of a Greek poet, and has any sympathy to impart to the alert and heroic reader and as for the sacred scriptures or bibles of mankind who in this town can tell me even their titles most men do not know that any nation but the hebrews have had a scripture a man any man will go considerably out of his way to pick up a silver dollar but here are golden words which the wisest men of antiquity have uttered, and whose words the wise of every succeeding age have assured us of. And yet we learn to read only as far as easy reading, the primers and class books, and when we leave school the little reading, and story-books, which are for boys and beginners, and our reading, our conversation and thinking, are all on a very low level, worthy only of pygmies and mannequins. I aspire to be acquainted with wiser men than this our concord soil has produced, whose names are hardly known here. Or shall I hear the name of Plato and never read his book? As if Plato were my townsman, and I never saw him, my next neighbor, and I never heard him speak or attended to the wisdom of his words. But how actually is it his dialogues which contain what was immortal in him lie on the next shelf and yet i never read them we are underbred and low-lived and illiterate and in this respect i confess I do not make any very broad distinction between the illiterateness of my townsman who cannot read at all, and the illiterateness of him who has learned to read only what is for children and feeble intellects. We should be as good as the worthies of antiquity, but partly by first knowing how good they were. We are a race of titmen, and soar but little higher in our intellectual flights than the columns of the daily paper. It is not all books that are as dull as their readers. There are probably words addressed to our condition exactly, which, if we could really hear and understand, would be more salutary than the morning or the spring to our lives and possibly put a new aspect on the face of things for us. How many a man has dated a new era in his life from the reading of a book? The book exists for us, perchance, which will explain our miracles and reveal new ones. The at present unutterable things we may find somewhere uttered. These same questions that disturb and puzzle and confound us 
have in their turn occurred to all the wise men. Not one has been omitted, and each has answered them according to his ability by his words and his life. Moreover, with wisdom we shall learn liberality. The solitary hired man on a farm in the outskirts of Concord, who has had his second birth and peculiar religious experience, and is driven, as he believes, into the silent gravity and exclusiveness by his faith, may think it is not true. But Zoroaster, thousands of years ago, traveled the same road and had the same experience. But he, being wise, knew it to be universal, and treated his neighbors accordingly, and is even said to have invented and established worship among men. Let him humbly commune with Zoroaster, then, and through the liberalizing influence of all the worthies, with Jesus Christ himself, and let our church go by the board. We boast that we belong to the nineteenth century, and are making the most rapid strides of any nation. But consider how little this village does for its own culture. I do not wish to flatter my townsmen, nor to be flattered by them, for that will not advance either of us. We need to be provoked, goaded like oxen, as we are, into a trot. We have a comparatively decent system of common schools, schools for infants only, but excepting the half-starved lyceum in the winter, and laterally the puny beginning of a library suggested by the state, no school for ourselves. We spend more on almost any article of bodily aliment or ailment than our mental aliment. It is time that we had uncommon schools, that we did not leave off our education when we begin to be men and women. It is time that villages were universities, and their elderly inhabitants the fellows of universities, with leisure, if they are indeed so well off, to pursue liberal studies the rest of their lives. Shall the world be confined to one Paris or one Oxford for ever? Cannot students be boarded here? and get a liberal education under the skies of Concord. Can we not hire some Abelard to lecture to us? Alas, what with foddering the cattle and tending the store, we are kept from school too long, and our education is sadly neglected. In this country the village should in some respects take the place of the nobleman of Europe. It should be the patron of the fine arts. It is rich enough. It wants only the magnanimity and refinement. It can spend money enough on such things as farmers and traders value, but it is thought utopian to propose spending money for things which more intelligent men know to be of far more worth. This town has spent seventeen thousand dollars on a town house. Thank fortune or politics, but probably it will not spend so much on living wit, the true meat 
to put into that shell in a hundred years. The one hundred and twenty-five dollars annually subscribed for a lyceum in the winter is better spent than any other equal sum raised in the town. If we live in the nineteenth century, why should we not enjoy the advantages which the nineteenth century offers? Why should our life be in any respect provincial? If we will read newspapers, why not skip the gossip of Boston and take the best newspaper in the world at once, not be sucking the pap of neutral family papers or browsing olive branches here in New England. Let the reports of all the learned societies come to us, and we will see if they know anything. Why? Should we leave it to Harper and Brothers and Redding and Company to select our reading? As the nobleman of cultivated taste surrounds himself with whatever conduces to his culture, genius, learning, wit, books, paintings, statuary, music, philosophical instruments, and the like, so let the village do not stop short at a pedagogue, a parson, a sexton, a, a parish library, and three select men, because our pilgrim forefathers got through a cold winter once on a bleak rock with these. To act collectively is according to the spirit of our institutions, and I am confident that, as our circumstances are more flourishing, our means are greater than the noblemen's. New England can hire all the wise men in the world to come and teach her, and board them round the while, and not be provincial at all. That is the uncommon school we want. Instead of noble men, let us have noble villages of men. If it is necessary, omit one bridge over the river, go round a little there, and throw one arch, at least, over the darker gulf of ignorance which surrounds us. End of chapter 3 Walden by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 4 Sounds But while we are confined to books, though the most select and classic, and read only particular written languages, which are themselves but dialects and provincial, we are in danger of forgetting the language which all things and events speak without metaphor which alone is copious and standard. Much is published, but little printed. The rays which stream through the shutter will be no longer remembered when the shutter is wholly removed. No method nor discipline can supersede the necessity of being forever on the alert. What is a course of history or philosophy or poetry no matter how well selected, or the best society, or the most admirable routine of life compared with the discipline of looking always at what is to be seen. Will you be a reader, a student merely, or a seer? Read your fate, see what is before you, and walk on into futurity. I did not read books the first summer. I hoed beans. Nay, I often did better than this. There were times when I could not afford to sacrifice the bloom of the present moment to any work, whether of the head or hands. 
I love a broad margin to my life. Sometimes, in a summer morning, having taken my accustomed bath, I sat in my sunny doorway, from sunrise till noon, wrapped in a reverie, amidst the pines and hickories and sumacs, in undisturbed solitude and stillness, while the birds sing around or flitted noiseless through the house, until by the sun falling in at my west window, with the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time. I grew in those seasons, like corn in the night, and they were far better than any work of the hands would have been. They were not time subtracted from my life, but so much over and above my usual allowance. I realized what the Orientals mean by contemplation and the forsaking of works. For the most part, I minded not how the hours went. The day advanced as if to light some work of mine. It was morning, and lo, now it is evening, and nothing memorable is accomplished. Instead of singing like the birds, I silently smiled at my incessant good fortune. As the sparrow had its trill sitting on the hickory before my door, so had I my chuckle or suppressed warble which he might hear out of my nest. My days were not days of the week, bearing the stamp of any heathen deity, nor were they minced into hours and fretted by the ticking of a clock. For I lived like the Puri Indians, of whom it is said that, for yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they have only one word, and they express the variety of meaning by pointing backward for yesterday, forward for tomorrow, and overhead for the passing day. This was sheer idleness to my fellow townsmen, no doubt. But if the birds and flowers had tried me by their standard, I should not have been found wanting. A man must find his occasions in himself, it is true. The natural day is very calm, and will hardly reprove his indolence. I had this advantage at least in my mode of life, over those who were obliged to look abroad for amusement to society and the theatre, that my life itself was become my amusement, and never ceased to be novel. It was a drama of many scenes, and without an end. If we were always, indeed, getting our living, and regulating our lives according to the last and best mode we had learned, we should never be troubled with ennui. Follow your genius closely enough, and it will not fail to show you a fresh prospect every hour. Housework was a pleasant pastime. When my floor was dirty, I rose early, and, setting all of my furniture out of doors on the grass, bed and bedstead making but one budget, dashed water on the floor, and sprinkled white sand from the pond on it, and then with a broom scrubbed it clean and white and by the time the villagers ha had broken their fast, the morning sun had dried my house sufficiently to allow me to move in again, 
and my meditations were almost uninterrupted. It was pleasant to see my whole household effects out on the grass, making a little pile like a gypsy's pack, and my three-legged table, from which I did not remove the books and pen and ink, standing amid the pines and hickory. They seemed glad to get out themselves, and as if unwilling to be brought in. I was sometimes tempted to stretch an awning over them and take my seat there. It was worth the while to see the sun shine on these things, and hear the free wind blow on them. So much more interesting most familiar objects look out of doors than in the house. A bird sits on the next bough. Life everlasting grows under the table, and blackberry vines run round its legs. Pine cones, chestnut burrs, and strawberry leaves are strewn about. It looks as if this was the way these forms came to be transferred to our furniture, to tables, chairs, and bedsteads, because they once stood in their midst. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond, to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. In my front yard grew the strawberry, blackberry, and life everlasting, John's wort, and goldenrod, shrub, oaks, and sand cherry, blueberry, and ground nut. Near the end of May, the sand cherry, Cerasus pumilla, adorned the sides of the path with its delicate flowers arranged in umbels cylindrically about its short stems, which last in the fall, weighed down with good-sized and handsome cherries, fell over in wreaths like rays on every side. I tasted them out of compliment to nature, though they were scarcely palatable. The sumac, rus glabra, grew luxuriantly about the house, pushing up through the embankment which I had made, and growing five or six feet the first season. Its broad, pinnate, tropical leaf was pleasant, though strange to look on. The large buds, suddenly pushing out late in the spring from dry sticks which had seemed to be dead, developed themselves as by magic into graceful green and tender boughs, an inch in diameter, and sometimes, as I sat at my window, so heedlessly did they grow and tax their weak joints, I heard a fresh and tender bough suddenly fall like a fan to the ground, when there was not a breath of air stirring, broken off by its own weight. In August the large masses of berries which, when in flower, had attracted many wild bees, gradually assumed their bright velvety crimson hue, and by their weight again bent down and broke the tender limbs. As I sit at my window this summer afternoon, hawks are circling about my clearing, the tantivy of wild pigeons flying by two and threes athwart my view, or perching restless on the white pine boughs behind my house, gives a voice to the air. A fish-hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish. A mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes a frog by the shore. The sedge is bending under the weight of the reed-birds flitting hither and thither, and for the last half-hour I have heard the rattle of railroad cars. 
now dying away and then reviving like the beat of a partridge, conveying travelers from Boston to the country. For I did not live so out of the world as that boy who, as I hear, was put out to a farmer in the east part of the town, but ere long ran away and came home again, quite down at the heel and homesick. He had never seen such a dull and out-of-the-way place. The folks were all gone off. Why, you couldn't even hear the whistle. I doubt if there is such a place in Massachusetts now. In truth, our village has become a butt for one of those fleet railroad shafts, and o'er our peaceful plain its soothing sound is Concord. The Fitchburg Railroad touches the pond about a hundred rods south of where I dwell. I usually go to the village along its causeway, and am, as it were, related to society by this link. The men on the freight trains, who go over the whole length of the road, bow to me as to an old acquaintance. They pass me so often, and apparently they take me for an employee. And so I am. I, too, would fain be a track repairer somewhere in the orbit of the earth. The whistle of the locomotive penetrates my woods summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard, informing me that many restless city merchants are arriving within the circle of the town, or adventurous country traders from the other side. As they come under one horizon, they shout their warning to get off the track to the other, heard sometimes through the circles of two towns. Here come your groceries, country, your rations, countrymen. Nor is there any man so independent on his farm that he can say them nay. And here's your pay for them, screams the countryman's whistle. Timber like long battering rams going twenty miles an hour against the city's walls, and chairs enough to seat all the weary and heavy laden that dwell within them. With such huge and lumbering civility the country hands a chair to the city. All the Indian huckleberry hills are stripped, all the cranberry meadows are raked into the city. Up comes the cotton, down goes the woven cloth, up comes the silk, down goes the woolen, up comes the books, but down goes the wit that writes them. When I meet the engine with its train of cars moving off with planetary motion, or rather like a comet, for the beholder knows not if with that velocity and with that direction it will ever revisit this system, since its orbit does not look like a returning curve. With its steam cloud like a banner streaming behind it in golden and silver wreaths, like many a downy cloud which I have seen high in the heavens, unfolding its masses to the light, as if this traveling demigod, this cloud compeller, would ere long take the sunset sky for the livery of his train. When I hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort like thunder, shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, what kind of winged horse or fiery dragon they will put into the new mythology I don't know. It seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it. If all were as it seems, and men made the elements their servants for noble ends. If the cloud that hangs over the engine were the perspiration of heroic deeds, or as beneficent as that which floats over the farmer's fields, then the elements and nature herself would cheerfully accompany men on their errands and be their escort. 
I watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that I do the rising of the sun, which is hardly more regular, their train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher, going to heaven while the cars are going to Boston, conceals the sun for a minute, and casts my distant field into the shade. A celestial train beside which the petty train of cars which hugs the earth is but the barb of the spear. The stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed. Fire, too, was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off, if the enterprise were as innocent as it is early. If the snow lies deep, they strap on him snowshoes, and, with the giant plow, plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard, in which the cars, like a following drill barrow, sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed. All day the fire steed flies over the country, stopping only that his master may rest, and I am awakened by his tramp and defiant snort at midnight, when in some remote glen in the woods he fronts the elements encased in ice and snow, and he will reach his stall only with the morning star, to start once more in his travels without rest or slumber. Or perchance at evening I hear him in his stable, blowing off the superfluous energy of the day, that he may calm his nerves and cool his liver and brain for a few hours of iron slumber. If the enterprise were as heroic and commanding as it is protracted and unwearied. Far through unfrequented woods on the confines of towns, where once only the hunter penetrated by day, in the darkest night dart these bright saloons, without the knowledge of their inhabitants. This moment stopping at some brilliant station house in town or city, where a social crowd is gathered, the next in the dismal swamp, scaring the owl and fox. The startings and arrivals of the cars are now the epochs in the village day. They go and come with such regularity and precision, and their whistle can be heard so far that the farmers set their clocks by them, and thus one well-conducted institution regulates a whole country. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Did they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere of the former place. I have been astonished at the miracles it has wrought, that some of my neighbors who, I should have prophesied once for all, would never get to Boston by so prompt a conveyance, are on hand when the bell rings, to do things railroad fashion is now the byword, and it is worth the while to be warned so often and so sincerely by any power to get off its track. There is no stopping to read the riot act, no firing over the heads of the mob in this case. We have constructed we have constructed a fate, an atropos, that never turns aside. Let that be the name of your engine. Men are advertised, 
that at a certain hour and minute these bolts will be shot toward particular points of the compass, yet it interferes with no man's business, and the children go to school on the other track. We live the steadier for it. We are all educated thus to be sons of tell. The air is full of invisible bolts. Every path but your own is the path of fate. Keep on your own track, then. What recommends commerce to me is its enterprise and bravery. It does not clasp its hands and pray to Jupiter. I see these men every day go about their business with more or less courage and content, doing more even than they suspect, and perchance better employed than they could have consciously devised. I am less affected by their heroism, who stood up for half an hour in the front line at Buena Vista, than by the steady and cheerful valor of the men who inhabit the snow-plough for their winter quarters, who have not merely the three o'clock in the morning courage, which Bonaparte thought was the rarest, but whose courage does not go to rest so early, who go to sleep only when the storm sleeps or the sinews of their iron steed are frozen. On this morning of the great snow, perchance, which is still raging and chilling men's blood, I bear the muffled tone of their engine bell from out the fog bank of their chilled breath, which announces that the cars are coming. Without long delay, notwithstanding the veto of a New England northeast snowstorm, and I behold the plowmen, covered with snow and rime, their heads peering above the mold board which is turning down other than daisies in the nests of field mice, like boulders of the Sierra Nevada that occupy an outside place in the universe. Commerce is unexpectedly confident and serene, alert, adventurous, and unwearied. It is very natural in its methods withal, far more so than many fantastic enterprises and sentimental experiments, and hence its singular success. I am refreshed and expanded when the freight train rattles past me, and I smell the stores which go dispensing their odors all the way from Long Wharf to Lake Champlain, reminding me of foreign parts, of coral reefs and Indian oceans and tropical climes and the extent of the globe. I feel more like a citizen of the world at the sight of the palm-leaf which will cover so many flaxen New England heads the next summer, the manila hemp, and coconut husks, the old junk, gunny bags, scrap iron and rusty nails. This carload of torn sails is more legible and interesting now than if they should be wrought into paper and printed books. Who can write so graphically the history of the storms they have weathered as these rents have done? They are proof-sheets which need no correction. Here goes lumber from the main woods, which did not go out to sea in the last freshet, risen four dollars on the thousand because of what did go out or was split up. Pine, spruce, cedar, first, second, third, and fourth qualities, so lately all of one quality, to wave over the bear and moose and caribou. Next rolls Thomaston Lime, a prime lot, which will get far among the hills before it gets slacked. These rags and bales of all hues and qualities, 
the lowest condition to which cotton and linen descend, the final result of dress, of patterns which are now no longer cried up, unless it be in Milwaukee, as those splendid articles, English, French, or American prints, ginghams, muslins, etc., gathered from all quarters both of fashion and poverty, going to become paper of one color, or a few shades only, on which forsooth will be written tales of real life, high and low, and founded on fact. This closed car smells of salt fish, the strong New England and commercial scent, reminding me of the grand banks and the fisheries. Who has not seen a salt fish thoroughly cured for this world, so that nothing can spoil it, and putting the perseverance of the saints to blush? With which you may sweep or pave the streets and split your kindlings, and the teamster shelter himself and his lading against sun, wind, and rain behind it, and the trader, as a Concord trader once did, hang it up by his door for a sign when he commences business, until at last his oldest customer cannot tell surely whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral, and yet it shall be as pure as a snowflake, and if it be but put into a pot and boiled will come out an excellent dunfish for a Saturday's dinner. Next, Spanish hides, with the tails still preserving their twist and the angle of elevation they had when the oxen that wore them were careering over the pampas of the Spanish main, a type of all obstinacy, and evincing how almost hopeless and incurable are all constitutional vices. I confess that, practically speaking, when I have learned a man's real disposition, I have no hopes of changing it for the better or worse in this state of existence. As the Orientals say, a cur's tail may be warmed and pressed and bound round with ligatures, and after a twelve years' labor bestowed upon it, still it will retain its natural form. The only effectual cure for such inveteracies as these tales exhibit is to make glue of them, which I believe is what is usually done with them, and then they will stay put and stick. Here is a hog's head of molasses, or of brandy, directed to John Smith, Cuttingsville, Vermont, some trader among the green mountains, who imports for the farmers near his clearing, and now perchance stands over his bulkhead and thinks of the last arrivals on the coast, how they may affect the price for him, telling his customers this moment, as he has told them twenty times before this morning, that he expects some by the next train of prime quality. It is advertised in the Cuttingsville Times. While these things go up, other things come down. Warned by the whizzing sound, I look up from my book and see some tall pine hewn on far northern hills, which has winged its way over the green mountains and the Connecticut, shot like an arrow through the township within ten minutes, and scarce another eye beholds it going to be the mast of some great admiral. And hark, here comes the cattle train, bearing the cattle of a thousand hills, sheep cots, stables, and cow yards in the air, Drovers with their sticks and shepherd boys in the midst of their flocks, all but the mountain pastures, whirled along like leaves blown from the mountains by the September gale. The air is filled with the bleating of calves and sheep and the hustling of oxen, as if a pastoral valley were going by. 
when the old bell-weather at the head rattles his bell, the mountains do indeed skip like rams, and the little hills like lambs. A carload of drovers, too, in the midst, on a level with their droves now, their vocation gone, but still clinging to their useless sticks as their badge of office. But their dogs, where are they? It is a stampede to them. They are quite thrown out. They have lost the scent. Methinks I hear them barking behind the Peterborough hills, or panting up the western slope of the green mountains. They will not be in at the death. Their vocation, too, is gone. Their fidelity and sagacity are below par now. They will slink back to their kennels in disgrace, or perchance run wild and strike a league with the wolf and the fox. So is your pastoral life world past and away. But the bell rings, and I must get off the track and let the cars go by. What's the railroad to me? I never go to see where it ends. It fills a few hollows and makes banks for the swallows. It sets the sand a-blowing and the blackberries a-growing. But I cross it like a cart-path in the woods. I will not have my eyes put out and my ears spoiled by its smoke and steam and hissing. Now that the cars are gone by and all the restless world with them, and the fishes in the pond no longer feel their rumbling, I am more alone than ever. For the rest of the long afternoon, perhaps, my meditations are interrupted only by the faint rattle of a carriage or team along the distant highway. Sometimes, on Sundays, I heard the bells, the Lincoln, Acton, Bedford, or Concord bell, when the wind was favorable. A faint, sweet, and, as it were, natural melody, worth importing into the wilderness. At a sufficient distance over the woods this sound acquires a certain vibratory hum, as if the pine needles in the horizon were the strings of a harp which it swept. All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, a vibration of the universal lyre just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. There came to me in this case a melody which the air had strained, and which had conversed with every leaf and needle of the wood, that portion of the sound which the elements had taken up and modulated and echoed from veil to veil. The echo is, to some extent, an original sound, and therein is the magic and charm of it. It is not merely a repetition of what was worth repeating in the bell, but partly the voice of the wood, the same trivial words and notes sung by a wood-nymph. At evening, the distant lowing of some cow in the horizon beyond the woods sounded sweet and melodious, and at first I would mistake it for the voices of certain minstrels, by whom I was sometimes serenaded, who might be straying over hill and dale. But soon I was not unpleasantly disappointed when it was prolonged into the cheap and natural music of the cow. I do not mean to be satirical, but to express my appreciation of those youths singing when I state that I perceived clearly that it was akin to the music of the cow, and they were at length one articulation of nature. Regularly at half-past seven in one part of the summer, 
After the evening train had gone by, the whippoorwills chanted their vespers for half an hour, sitting on a stump by my door, or upon the ridge-pole of the house. They would begin to sing almost with as much precision as a clock, within five minutes of a particular time, referred to the setting of the sun every evening. I had a rare opportunity to become acquainted with their habits. Sometimes I heard four or five at once in different parts of the wood, by accident one a bar behind another, and so near me that I distinguished not only the cluck after each note, but often that singular buzzing sound like a fly in a spider's web, only proportionally louder. Sometimes one would circle round and round me in the woods, a few feet distance as if tethered by a string, when probably I was near its eggs. They sang at intervals throughout the night, and were again as musical as ever, just before and about the dawn. When other birds are still, the screech-owls take up the strain, like mourning women with their ancient ululu. Their dismal scream is truly Ben Johnsonian, wise midnight hags. It is no honest and blunt to wit to woo of the poets, but without jesting, a most solemn graveyard ditty, the mutual consolations of suicide lovers, remembering the pangs and the delights of supernal love in the infernal groves. Did I love to hear their wailing, their doleful responses trilled along the woodside, reminding me sometimes of music, and singing birds, as if it were the dark and tearful side of music, the regrets and sighs that would fain be sung. They are the spirits, the low spirits and melancholy forebodings of fallen souls that once in human shape night walked the earth and did the deeds of darkness now expiating their sins with their wailing hymns or threnodies in the scenery of their transgressions. They give me a new sense of the variety and capacity of that nature which is our common dwelling. Oh, oh, that I never had been born sighs one on this side of the pond, and circles with the restlessness of despair to some new perch on the gray oaks, then, that I had never been born, echoes another on the farther side with tremulous sincerity, and, born, comes faintly from far in the Lincoln woods. I was also serenaded by a hooting owl. Near at hand you could fancy it the most melancholy sound in nature, as if she meant by this to stereotype and make permanent in her choir the dying moans of a human being, some poor, weak relic of mortality who has left hope behind and howls like an animal, yet with human sobs on entering the dark valley made more awful by a certain gurgling melodiousness. I find myself beginning with the letters G, L, when I try to imitate it, expressive of a mind which has reached the gelatinous, mildewy stage in the mortification of all healthy and courageous thought. It reminded me of ghouls and idiots and insane howlings. But now one answers from far woods in a strain made really melodious by distance. Hoo, 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 
who, and indeed for the most part of it, suggested only by pleasing associations, whether heard by day or night, summer or winter. I rejoice that there are owls. Let them do the idiotic and maniacal hooting for men. It is a sound admirably suited to swamps and twilight woods which no day illustrates, suggesting a vast and undeveloped nature which men have not recognized. They represent the stark twilight and unsatisfied thoughts which all have. All day the sun has shone on the surface of some savage swamp where the single spruce stands hung with usnea lichens and small hawks circulate above and the chickadee lisps amid the evergreens and the partridge and rabbit skulk beneath. But now a more dismal and fitting day dawns, and a different race of creatures awakes to express the meaning of nature there. Late in the evening I heard the distant rumbling of wagons over bridges, a sound heard farther than almost any other at night, the baying of dogs, and sometimes again the lowing of some disconsolate cow in a distant barnyard. In the meanwhile all the shore rang with the trump of bullfrogs, the sturdy spirits of ancient wine-bibers and wassailers, still unrepentant, trying to sing a catch in their Stygian lake. If the Walden nymphs will pardon the comparison, for though there are almost no weeds, there are frogs there, who would fain keep up the hilarious rules of their old festal tables, though their voices have waxed hoarse and solemnly grave, mocking at mirth, and the wine has lost its flavor, and become only liquor to distend their paunches, and sweet intoxication never comes to drown the memory of the past but mere saturation and water-loggedness and distension. The almost aldermanic, with his chin upon a heart-leaf which serves for a napkin to his drooling chaps, under this northern shore quaffs a deep draught of the once scorned water and passes round the cup with ejaculation Trunk, 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 and straightway comes over the water from some distant cove the same password repeated, where the next in seniority and girth has gulped down to his mark, and when this observance has made the circuit of the shores, there ejaculates the master of ceremonies with satisfaction. Drunk. And each in his turn repeats the same down to the least distended, leakiest, and flabbiest paunched, that there be no mistake. And then the howl goes round again and again, until the sun disperses the morning mist, and only the patriarch is not under the pond, but vainly bellowing tronk from time to time, and pausing for a reply. I am not sure that I ever heard the sound of cock crowing from my clearing, and I thought that it might be worth a while to keep a cockerel for his music merely as a singing bird. The note of this once wild Indian pheasant is certainly the most remarkable of any birds, and if they could be naturalized without being domesticated, it would soon become the most famous sound in our woods, surpassing the clangor of the goose and the hooting of the owl, and then imagine the cackling of the hens to fill the pauses when their lord's clarions rested. No wonder that man added this bird to his tame stock, to say nothing of the eggs and drumsticks. 
to walk in a winter morning in a wood where these birds abounded their native woods and hear the wild cockerels crow on the trees clear and shrill for miles over the resounding earth drowning the feebler notes of other birds think of it it would put nations on the alert who would not be early to rise and rise earlier and earlier every successive day of his life till he became unspeakably healthy wealthy and wise this foreign bird's note is celebrated by the poets of all countries along with the notes of their native songsters all climates agree with brave chanticleer he is more indigenous even than the natives his health is ever good his lungs are sound his spirits never flag even the sailor on the atlantic and pacific is awakened by his voice but its shrill sound never roused me from my slumbers i kept neither dog cat cow pig nor hens so that you would have said there was a deficiency of domestic sounds neither the churn nor the spinning wheel nor even the singing of the kettle nor the hissing of the urn and nor children crying to comfort one an old-fashioned man would have lost his senses and died of ennui before this not even rats in the wall for they were starved out or rather were never baited in only squirrels on the roof and under the floor a whippoorwill on the ridge pole a blue jay screaming beneath the window a hare or woodchuck under the house a screech owl or a cat owl behind it a flock of wild geese or a laughing loon on the pond and a fox to bark in the night not even a lark or an oriole those mild plantation birds ever visited my clearing no cockerels to crow nor hens to cackle in the yard no yard but unfenced nature reaching up to your very sills a young forest growing up under your meadows and wild sumacs and blackberry vines breaking through into your cellar sturdy pitch pines rubbing and creaking against the shingles for want of room their roots reaching quite under the house instead of a scuttle or a blind blown off in the gale a pine tree snapped off or torn up by the roots behind your house for fuel instead of no path to the front yard gate in the great snow no gate no front yard and no path to the civilized world end of chapter 4